here. His name is Professor Elmos Beal. He received his PhD from the Department of Cell Biology at the Baylor College of Medicine, that's in Houston, Texas. He did his postdoctoral training at the Department of Internal Medicine, University of Iowa College, <coughs> excuse me, of medicine. Currently, he's, uh, he's associate professor at the Department of Cell Biology and Biochemistry, Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center, that's in Texas. So he'll be our moderator for the entire afternoon. Please, Professor. Thank you. So for this afternoon, we're, we're going to do our best to stay on time. So we'll take one break every hour, a five minute break. And so uh, I encourage everybody at break time to get up, stretch your legs, go to the restroom if you need to, and please be back here promptly uh, after five minutes. So we have three presentations this afternoon, uh, two on basic science. First is microbiology, the second is pathology. And then at the end of the day, uh, the uh, cardiologist that spoke to you this morning will come back and talk about uh, her experiences and how to find a place in the United States for training. So hopefully you'll find it a useful afternoon. And our first speaker today is my friend and colleague, Dr. David Strauss. Dr. Strauss is a microbiologist, and he's originally from the state of Ohio. Um, he received his Ph.D. from Loyola University, which is in Chicago, Illinois. He did a postdoctoral fellowship in microbiology at the University of Cincinnati. He came to my institution, Texas Tech, in 1981, and he is currently professor of microbiology at Texas Tech. His research interests center around, as you might imagine, microbiology. Um, he is currently well known throughout the U.S. and probably internationally for his work on air quality, both indoor and outdoor. He's probably one of the world's experts in mold and the toxicology of mold that we find inside buildings and such as that. One of my favorite quotes from Dr. Strauss is, you need to thank microbiologists because we save the world from disease. He has a long list of uh, honors and especially teaching awards. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Strauss. David. Thank you, thank you Dr. Beal. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Beale. Those are the nicest things he's ever said about me. So I'm glad I got a large audience uh, to hear it. Um, what we're going to do today is spend uh, two hours on microbiology and immunology. And as you can imagine, as Dr. Tenner said, it's really impossible to uh, cover all of microbiology and immunology in two hours. So what I'm going to do is um, give you first, I think I have about 15 lines or 15 numbers here of the things that I think you ought to write down and study and essentially memorize uh, until they make complete sense to you because I think these are the most important things that you need to know about microbiology and immunology. And uh, then after I've done that, then what we'll do is we'll go through questions and I'm going to do the, uh, the voting on each question. That way I'll know if you understand the question. If you understand the question, then we don't need to spend a lot of time on it. If you don't understand the question, then we'll go through each of the an possible answers and try to understand uh, what you don't understand about it. Okay, so the first thing then that I would recommend that you do when you're studying for the uh, USMLE is to essentially write down the names of all of the major bacteria. And as you can imagine, there are hundreds of them. Uh, some of them obviously are more important than others. Uh, the example I've given you here uh, as well as, of course, the diseases that they cause. The example I've given you here is Streptococcus pneumoniae. You should know which organisms are gram-positive or negative because, as you'll see in the questions, they'll assume that you know which organisms are gram-positive and negative. And they'll also assume you understand what, what diseases these organisms cause. So you can see then Streptococcus pneumoniae written down as a gram-positive organism and causes low bar pneumonia. 
Uh, other examples would be Bacillus anthracis, which causes anthrax, uh, Streptococcus pyogenes, which causes streptococcal sore throat and a variety of other uh, types of diseases. So I'd recommend then you write down the names of all the organisms, whether they're gram-positive or gram-negative, and then uh, what types of disease they cause. <clears throat> Then I recommend that you know all the major viruses. You want to do exactly the same thing again and the diseases they cause. For example, herpes simplex virus uh, is a double-stranded DNA virus that causes cold sores and uh, HSV-1. And then, of course, genital sores are caused by HSV-2. So you want to do exactly the same thing for all the viruses that you did for the bacteria. And I think you begin to see the massive numbers of organisms that you begin to accumulate. The third thing that I'd recommend you do is, is the same thing with the fungi. You want to write down the names of all of the fungi and the diseases that they cause. The example that I've given you here is Cryptococcus neoformans. It's an encapsulated yeast that causes human lung infections. Uh, you essentially get it by inhaling the organisms, uh, which the spores of the organism, which can be found in soil. Then, as if that wasn't enough, I would recommend that you write down the names of all of the major parasites and the diseases that they cause. The example I've given you here is Plasmodium vivax, which is a blood protozoan and causes human malaria. So you want to write down the names of all of the uh, parasites and the diseases that they cause as well. Then you can begin to, to break these organisms down into the virulence factors that they produce. So not only are there many, many bacterial, fungal, parasitic, and viral organisms, but they produce many different virulence factors which allow them to cause human disease. You have to know these things as well. I would recommend that you know all of the major bacterial toxins and their mechanism of action because these types of questions appear uh, on the uh, step one exam. The example that I've given you here is the diphtheria toxin which works by an activation of elongation factor two by binding an ADP ribocele <coughs> group to it. So all of the different bacterial toxins, there's the anthrac toxin, the botulism toxin, uh, clostridium perfringens alpha toxin, write down the names of all of the major bacterial toxins, how they work, and then those are things that you need to learn as well. For example, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a gram-negative rod, produces a bacterial toxin which has exactly the same mechanism of action as does the diphtheria toxin, which is produced by a gram-positive rod. And so here you have a gram-positive organism and a gram-negative organism producing toxins that work by exactly the same mechanism, although the amino acid sequence of their proteins is different. That is also something that you need to know. Then not only do bacteria, of course, produce toxins, as I'm sure you're aware, they also have the capability of invading the human body. For example, if you introduce a pathogenic organism like Streptococcus pyogenes into a cut, why is it capable then of avoiding phagocytosis and replicating in the body and causing human disease? Well, Streptococcus uh, pyogenes can do this by virtue of the production of a virulence factor called the M protein. And the M protein allows the organism to resist phagocytosis by PMNs and macrophages uh, in, the, in the immune system. You have to understand that. The other uh, virulence factor that I've uh, recommended here to you is uh, the carbohydrate capsule of Streptococcus pneumoniae. Streptococcus pneumoniae causes low bar pneumonias, and when the organism is introduced into the lungs, it's not phagocytized by alveolar macrophages because it produces a large carbohydrate capsule which allows it to avoid phagocytosis. So you need to understand then the mechanisms that the bacteria use to avoid phagocytosis when they're introduced into the human body. And it, then again, as if that wasn't enough, you need to understand and know all of the major antibiotics. You need to know them by name, and you need to understand their mechanism of action. The example that I've given you here is penicillin, which of course is probably the well, most well-known of all of the antibiotics, and it works by binding to penicillin binding proteins and enzymes responsible for peptidoglycan synthesis. So you need to write down then all of the major antibiotics 
uh, streptomycin, um, the aminoglycosides, the cephalosporins, and understand their mechanism of action. And then also you need to understand when you would use those antibiotics. Would you use them against a gram positive or against a gram negative? For example, you use vancomycin against gram positive bacteria. It doesn't work very well against gram negatives. That also is something I'd recommend that, that you understand. Then also, since immunology is a part of what I'm going to talk about today, you need to understand the difference between humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity. And humoral immunity then relies on the production of antibodies. Essentially what happens, for example, if a pathogenic organism is introduced into your body, the body responds by producing antibodies against that organism, the purpose being then to help it to be phagocytized into a phagocytic cell, like a macrophage or a PMN. Uh, that's called uh, opsonization. The coding of bacteria with antibodies is called opsonization. It's Latin for mate, meaning it makes it taste good. And then that allows, of course, phagocytes to ingest it. Unfortunately, there are some organisms which can be taken inside of normal phagocytic cells like macrophages and PMNs, and they are not killed. This is why we need the cell-mediated immune system. So examples of bacteria that are killed by humoral immunity would be Streptococcus pyogenes, uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae. We produce antibodies against those organisms, which allow them to be phagocytized, uh, ingested by phagocytes where they are killed. But Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which of course, as I'm sure you all know, produces the disease tuberculosis, if it's taken inside of a normal macrophage, it is not killed. It has the ability to survive inside of normal macrophages. Therefore, we need another wing of the immune system to kill those organisms, and indeed, that is what cell-mediated immunity does for us. So in cell-mediated immunity, what happens is you have T cells which recognize the presence of Mycobacterium tuberculosis, and they activate, they activate macrophages. So when the macrophages now ingest Mycobacterium tuberculosis, those organisms cannot survive inside of activated macrophages. They can survive inside of normal macrophages. That is cell-mediated immunity, and we need cell-mediated immunity because there are some organisms which can survive inside of normal macrophages, and therefore we need an immune mechanism which allows us to kill those organisms. So you need to understand the difference between humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity. All right, point number nine is uh, relevant to what I have just told you. There are three different types of bacteria. They are called extracellular bacterial parasites, intracellular bacterial parasites, and obligate intracellular bacterial parasites. So Streptococcus pneumoniae is an extracellular bacterial parasite, and what that means is, is that it can survive outside of phagocytic cells, but when it's brought inside of phagocytic cells, it's killed. Therefore, it's an extracellular bacterial parasite, which means it can live outside of phagocytic cells. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is an intracellular bacterial parasite, and what that means is, is that it can live outside of phagocytic cells, and it can live inside of normal phagocytic cells. So that's an example of an intracellular bacterial parasite, because as you can see, this organism lives inside of normal macrophages. And then finally, there's a group of organisms. The chlamydia uh, is an example of that. Chlamydia trachomatis is what we call an obligate intracellular bacterial parasite, which means it must live inside of cells. It cannot grow outside of cells. And so you can see that's why I've added the word obligate. So any bacterium that you study, you want to be able to stick it into one of these three categories. It's either going to be an intracellular bacterial parasite, an extracellular bacterial parasite, or an obligate bacter intracellular bacterial parasite. So when you're studying these organisms, you need to understand how this organism is killed in the human body, and you can stick it into any one of these three categories. Then once again, as if that wasn't enough, you need to know which organisms like oxygen and which ones don't, because this becomes very important in some of the, say for example, the clostridial diseases, 
because the Clostridia are strict anaerobes, which means they will not grow in the presence of oxygen. So some organisms are strict aerobes. The example I give you here is Mycobacterium tuberculosis. And of course you would expect then an organism that is a strict aerobe would grow in the lungs quite nicely because that's where a very large supply of oxygen is. So that's probably the primary reason why Mycobacterium tuberculosis likes to grow in the lungs because as you can imagine, that's the most well aerated portion of the human body. There are organisms that will not grow in the presence of oxygen, and you need to know which those are. And the example I give you here is Clostridium perfringens. Clostridium perfringens is a strict anaerobe. So if it, it has any, if it is exposed to any oxygen at all, it will not grow. So you need to know which organisms are aerobes, anaerobes, and of course facultative anaerobes, which don't care whether they're growing in the presence of oxygen or not. Uh, you want to understand then from the immunology point of view, and I really already touched on this, so I'll just mention it again, how delayed type hypersensitivity protects in human bacterial infections. And essentially the way it protects is, once again, is that T cells, who have, uh, which are memory cells, or which can be memory cells, which have seen the organism before, essentially produce lymphokines that activate macrophages, and once the organism is injected by an activated macrophage, uh, this organism will be killed, and that is essentially delayed type hypersensitivity. Now, immunology is a, is a huge field unto itself, and I would recommend uh, that you understand, because you'll see a lot of questions on the major autoimmune diseases. Understand each of the autoimmune diseases, what its name is, and essentially how it affects the body. Is it a B cell defect? Is it a T cell defect? So I would highly recommend that you understand all of the autoimmune diseases. Write them down, write down the names, and write down the defects, and that will help you tremendously. Uh, the example I give you here is Wiscott-Aldridge syndrome, which is an X-linked defect in both T and B cell function. And so a person who has uh, Wiscott-Aldridge syndrome would be expected to show recurrent infections, hemorrhages, secondary to thrombocytopenia, and eczema. So many times in these questions, they'll say this child or this person has this syndrome, and they'll expect you then to come up with the name of the syndrome just by giving you, for example, some of the characteristics that I listed for you here. So that also I would recommend that you do. That's very important. Then as far as immunology goes, I would recommend that you, that you understand the four types of hypersensitivity and be able to describe them. And I've listed them for you here. Type 1 is an anaphylactic type immediate hypersensitivity, which is IgE mediated. Type 2 is a cytotoxic type, uh, you, you, the production, you get the production of cytotoxic antibodies, IgG and IgM, and these are formed against cell surface antigens. I apologize, I understand I've, I've been speaking too fast. I will <laughs> slow down. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Beal. I apologize, I just get excited about microbiology. It's a fascinating topic. All right, um, type two hypersensitivity. Um, you have autoimmune hemolytic anemia would be an example of type two hypersensitivity. Uh, type three hypersensitivity, you see immune complex types and, and the example I would give you here is glomerular nephritis and that's something that you need to understand. And then the fourth then, we really already talked about this, type four is cell-mediated immunity or granulomatous type disease like tuberculosis. And I think I've described that for you. Um, when we go through the questions, I think this will all, you'll, you'll see why the, uh, what I'm telling you now is going to be important that will allow you to answer the questions that I'm gonna show you. Then, even more than the fact that there are many different types of bacteria, many different types of viruses, many different types of parasites, many different types of fungi, there are vectors, arthropod vectors, which actually spread the organisms which I've been telling you about. Um, for example, in the United States, and, and I don't know if you have this here, I, I tend to doubt it, 
but in the U.S. we have a disease called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And this is spread by the arthropod vector, uh, a, a tick. Uh, there's also a disease which I'm sure you've all heard of. This is epidemic typhus. This is a disease which has uh, killed many, many soldiers uh, over the years. For example, Napoleon's army was probably defeated by the Russian winter and the human body louse. So the vector for spreading epidemic typhus is an arthropod. And the name of this uh, body louse is Pediculus humanus. So you also need to know not only the disease, the bacterium that causes it, but you also need to know the vector that spreads it from one individual to another. And finally, the last uh, point that I would recommend that you write down and know these things, there are bacteria which produce spores. Uh, and it's really, this is really quite simple because there's really only two important genera of spore producers, and these are Bacillus and the Clostridia. Um, for example, the disease anthrax is spread by uh, Bacillus anthracis, caused by Bacillus anthracis. And the way, of course, uh, humans catch anthrax is by being exposed to the spores of this organism. Uh, if Bacillus anthracis did not produce spores, there would be no anthrax. But of course, it does produce spores, and the spores are responsible for the spreading of the disease. The spores are very stable structures which can survive in the, in the soil for decades. And so this is why the disease Bacillus anthracis, or the, the disease anthrax is caused by Bacillus anthracis. And then the Clostridia produce spores which allow them to, to cause the diseases botulism and tetanus. For example, I'm sure you've all heard that if you step on a rusty nail, uh, you can catch tetanus if you're not immunized against the disease. And the reason, of course, is that spores can exist on a rusty nail for decades. It can just be sitting there waiting for you to step on it. Then when you drive the spores into your foot, you create anaerobic conditions. The organism is an anaerobe. The spore germinates in the body and be begins to produce the toxin that then causes tetanus. So you see, bacteria produce spores for a reason. And these spores allow the organism to survive in the environment for a very long period of time until a human being or an animal comes along and comes into contact with it. And then spore production and then the organism, the spore turning into the organism is what causes the disease. So those are the 15 things that I would recommend that, uh, and I know I spoke fast and I'm sorry, um, but you can go back and look at what I've written and just write down everything that I've written so that you'll understand. And I think if you know these things, I think you'll be very well prepared for the step one exam. So what I'd like to do now is uh, go through some questions and we'll, we'll see how you do. And if you, as I say, if you do very well on a question, then we'll know that we don't need to discuss it. But if you have problems with the question, then we'll take some time and uh, look at it. All right, so here's the first question. A 70-year-old nursing home resident develops pneumonia. Examination of sputum demonstrates many neutrophils and many lancet-shaped gram-positive cocci in pairs. Which of the following organisms is the most li likely cause of the patient's pneumonia? Haemophilus influenzae, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, Mycoplasma pneumoniae, Staphylococcus aureus, and Streptococcus pneumoniae. All right, go ahead and vote. All right, I see 87% said E, and, and that is wonderful. You guys got that correct, uh, question correct. Uh, for the, it looks like about 12% of the people, um, 
the reason why this answer is correct and none of the other ones is, is, is right here. And the fact that this is a lancet-shaped pair of cocci, and that tells you that it's Streptococcus pneumoniae because Streptococcus pneumoniae is a lancet-shaped organism that appears in cocci, in diplococci, in twos. So that's very good. Uh, we won't really discuss that any, need to discuss that anymore. Haemophilus influenzae, of course, is a gram-negative organism that can't be right. Mycobacterium tuberculosis is acid fast. That can't be right. Mycoplasma pneumoniae um, does not have a cell wall. Therefore, it can't be gram-positive or gram-negative. And of course, Staphylococcus aureus is a gram-positive coccus, so that could be correct. But the fact that it says that the organism is lancet-shaped means that Staphylococcus aureus is wrong. And of course, Streptococcus pneumoniae is right. Very good. All right, here's the second question. 45-year-old white male with a history of alcohol abuse and periodontal disease is brought to the emergency room for a spiking fever and chills. Physical, physical examination is significant for signs of lung consolidation. A chest x-ray shows a cavity in the right lower lobe that has an air slash fluid level. A transtracheal aspiration is performed and the specimen is submitted to the laboratory for routine cultures and gram stain. Based upon the clinical presentation, which of the following be the, would be the most likely finding? Anaerobic bacteria, Aspergillus fumigatus, Entamoeba histolytica, Staphylococcus aureus, or Streptococcus pyogenes. So go ahead and vote. Actually, you did very well. The correct answer is indeed A. But I, the first question I gave you was easy because I figured you guys would think, ah, microbiology is a piece of cake. And then I'm going to get a little tougher. But the majority of the class got it correct. The correct answer is A. And the reason is, and, and what tells you that's the correct answer is this right here. The patient had periodontal disease. And of course, you have anaerobic bacteria in the mouth in your plaque, anaerobic bacteria. And these organisms then can attack the teeth and gums. And you can see then that if you have this organism growing in your upper respiratory tract of, of the mouth, it's very easy then to aspirate these organisms down into the lungs. So the plaque uh, in the mouth is one of the great um, repositories for anaerobic bacteria. And that's why that's the correct answer. Uh, Asper Asper Aspergillus fumigatus, of course, is a fungus, which you commonly don't, do not find in the mouth. The same for Entamoeba histolytica, a parasite that's not commonly found in the mouth. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus, also, you would not expect to be commonly found in the upper respiratory tract. And the same, of course, is true as for Streptococcus pyogenes, which is not commonly found in, in the upper respiratory tract. However, of course, Streptococcus pyogenes can cause Streptococcus sore throat but it really doesn't happen very often. So, 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 so far, the group has done very well and has gotten the two first questions correct, so I'm real proud of you. All right, so we'll do a little immunology now. A 23-year-old skateboarder is brought to the hospital after fracturing his left humerus. His hospital course is uncomplicated until 72 hours into his hospital stay when he becomes taxonic and hypoxic. He does not respond to oxygen therapy, and a chest x-ray demonstrates diffuse bilateral infiltrates. Which of the following cells play a crucial role in the pathogenesis of this process? All right, go ahead and vote. All right. Unfortunately, the group has missed this question. But, you know, when I've looked at this question, and I agree with you, neutrophils is a very good answer for this, but it's not uh, the correct one. The correct answer is A. 
CD4 positive lymphocytes. CD4 positive lymphocytes are helper T cells, which help the, in the production of antibodies that would tend to uh, contain this particular infection. CD4 positive lymphocytes, of course, are cytotoxic cells, which would, of course would not be the right answer. Eosinophils are produced in allergic reactions. Uh, mast cells are important in allergic reactions. And neutrophils are, would be important in controlling this uh, particular infection, but the production of antibodies would be even more important, and that's why then CD4 positive lymphocytes are correct. The neutrophils would come in and they would be helpful with the production of antibodies uh, by the CD4 lymphocytes that would play a role in that particular process is, is the correct answer. All right, the next question. Now we get into a little bit of tuberculosis. Autopsy of a 23-year-old male victim of a motor vehicle accident reveals a small cluster of caseating granulomas in the right lung, just above the interlobar fissure, and similar granulomas are seen in the hilar lymph nodes. Acid fast staining demonstrates acid fast bacilli within these lesions. No other lesions were found in the remaining organs and systems. Which of the following is the most accurate interpretation of these findings? Okay, go ahead and vote. Very good. You guys are absolutely right. This is a definition. Someone has been teaching you microbiology well. I'm proud of you. This is the very definition of the GON complex. Uh, this, this, this slide describes it quite nicely. Um, cavitary tuberculosis would show blood in the sputum, so that's, that's why that one is incorrect. Of course, this is not a histoplasma infection. And miliary TB, of course, is the distribution of the organisms away from the lungs. That's essentially what miliary means. And of course, uh, it says that the organisms were not found in any other places, essentially, uh, but the lungs. So it's not miliary TB. And then, of course, um, remote healed tuberculosis. Because you're finding acid fast bacilli, it, it's not. Now, I, I look at the scores, and I see that no one picks C. And that's very good. Obviously, this is mycobacterium tuberculosis infection and not histoplasma, so that was, that was very good. You guys are doing very well. All right, the next question. A 31-year-old HIV-positive man develops a severe pneumonia. Lower respiratory tract secretions obtained by fiberoptic bronchoscopy with bronchial alveolar lavage and stained with methamine silver stain demonstrates roughly spherical cyst with sharply outlined walls. Which of the following organisms is the most likely pathogen in this case? And I expect I should get 100% right on this question. All right, go ahead and vote. Pretty, pretty close, pretty close. Of course, you guys got the correct answer. Pneumocystis carinii, which is now called Pneumocystis hirvecki, uh, is the uh, parasite which was first discovered to be uh, really highly associated with HIV. Uh, it was thought, of course, to be a parasite at first. Now we know that it is a fungus, but it is really the only possible answer for this question. Candida albicans, a fungus, uh, is not right. A Giardia parasite is not correct. Haemophilus influenza, which, of course, is a bacterium, is not right and Streptococcus pneumoniae, also a bacterium, is not correct. So this is the only possible answer, and I would expe have expected that you guys would have done uh, very well, uh, and indeed you did. All right, the next question. A 25-year-old man presents with a high fever and generalized malaise. His condition deteriorates so rapidly that his friends decide to take him to the emergency department 24 hours after the onset of symptoms. He has a history of uh, IV drug use, and the test for anti-HIV antibodies is negative. Physical examination reveals a systolic murmur, and the echocardiography shows bulky vegetations attached to the tricuspid valve leaflets. 
which of the following microorganisms will most likely be isolated from this patient's blood cultures? All right, go ahead and vote. Very good, very good. And indeed, of course, C is the correct answer. Now, for those of you who, who did not pick C, we'll kind of go over why uh, you may have picked uh, some of the organisms that you did. And, and I understand why you picked them, and I want you to understand why that's not correct. All right, most of the people who missed this question picked D and E. And indeed, D and E do cause uh, heart valve problems, but the type of heart valve problems that they cause is subacute bacterial endocarditis. And what subacute means is, is that it happens very slowly. So acute means a very rapid infection, and subacute means a very slow infection. So why, while D, uh, Staphylococcus epidermidis, and E, the viridans streptococci, do cause endocarditis. They cause subacute endocarditis, which happens very slowly. And what tips you off that the answer to this correction, this question is C, is right here. Very rapid onset and essentially 24 hours. So the viridans streptococci and Staphylococcus epidermidis would not be able to do that. They would cause disease much more slowly, perhaps even a matter of months. So you guys, once again, uh, the class was very wise and did indeed pick the right answer. All right, the next question. A 30-year-old woman is brought to the emergency department after a syncopal episode. Three months ago, she had a fever, chills, and generalized weakness during a visit to Cape Cod. Now, I know that you probably don't know Cape Cod, but it is a I will tell you it is a heavily wooded area, and that is important. Uh, it will be important now, and it would be important when, when you take this exam. She uses oral contraceptives. She used cocaine four months ago. Her blood pressure is 110 over 65 millimeters of mercury, and her pulse is 43 per minute. Chemistry results in a chest film are normal. An electrocardiogram reveals complete heart block, but there is no evidence of ischemia or prior infarct. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's complete heart block? Infection by Borrelia burgdorferi, infection by HIV, infection by Ixodes damonini, myocardial infarction from cocaine use, or myocardial infarction from a coronary thrombus. All right, go ahead and vote. Very good, and once again, the majority of the class got this correct. See, isn't, isn't microbiology wonderful? All right, in Borrelia burgdorferi, for those of you who missed this question, that of course is Lyme's disease, uh, is caused by this organism. So what gives this one away, and I, and I helped you a little bit by telling you about Cape Cod, it's a heavily wooded area, so that's where you, you would expect that this uh, woman ran into the deer tick and actually, this is the deer tick right here, Ixodes demini. And of course, this, the deer tick cannot cause an infection by itself. It can't infect, but of course, it can bite and introduce a Borrelia burgdorferi into her system, which indeed, of course, is what happened. And when this organism grows in the body, it can indeed cause this complete heart block. So that was the clue. There's me right there. Oh, okay. I'll go to it. 
ไป,ไปช่วยทำขยายตั้งแต่ข้อ30โทษนหน่อยเราไม่ได้ทำอะไรเลยนะครับเราไม่ได้ทำอะไรเลยนะครับเราไม่ได้ทำอะไรเลยนะครับเราไม่ได้ทำอะไรเลยนะครับเราไม่ได้ทำอะไรเลยนะครับเราไม่ได้ทำอะไรเลยนะครับเราไม่ได้ทำอะไรเลยนะครับเราไม่ได้ทำอะไรเลยนะครับเราไม่ได้ทำอะไรเลยนะครับเราไม่ได้ทำอะไรเลยนะครับ You would expect the blood cultures to grow. Streptococcus agalactiae, Streptococcus bovis, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Streptococcus pyogenes, and that last one, E, Streptococcus viridans, does not exist. It would, should read viridans streptococci. All right, uh, go ahead and vote. Yeah, I, th I thought this one would give you trouble, and, and, and indeed it has. This is, this is uh, something that you just, you either know it or you don't. And as it turns out, the correct answer to this one is B. And you see patients with colorectal cancer that have Streptococcus bovis, and we don't know if the organism is involved with the production of the cancer or whether it's just a marker for the fact that the cancer is there. Um, why you picked uh, the viridans streptococci, I, I, I don't really know as the majority. Uh, this just happens to be one that, that you just have to know because we don't understand the reason for it, so we can't explain it. It just happens to be a, a fact of, of microbiology. Uh, this one you shouldn't have any trouble with. A burn patient at the university hospital has been progressively deteriorating. He was catheterized for several days and developed a severe pneumonia for which he was intubated and is now uh, ventilator dependent. A gram negative non-fermenting rod is isolated from his sputum. It produces a blue-green pigment on growth media and has a grape-like fruity odor. The organism most likely isolated from this patient is uh, Escherichia coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Legionella pneumophila, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, or Serratius marcescens. Go ahead and vote. Very, very good. Actually, I thought it, it would be higher. I knew that you would get this answer correct, but I thought it would be higher. Um, a, a significant number of people missed this one, uh, so let's talk about why you missed it. Indeed, D is the correct answer. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, in fact, it takes its name, aeruginosa, um, from the fact that it produces this blue-green pigment. And another characteristic of Pseudomonas aeruginosa is that it has a grape-like fruity odor. When you take the top of the plate off of the Petri dish and you, you waft the smell towards you, you'll be, get a very sweet smell. So this question, uh, th the answer to this question is very obvious in that it's the blue-green pigment tips you off and the grape-like fruity, uh, fruity odor, of course, tips you off. Of course. You now know that you all need to go down and write the names of all of the bacteria, and when you do that, you'll, of course, see that Pseudomonas is a gram-negative rod, and it's a non-fermenting rod, which means it does not, essentially doesn't use uh, any of the sugars, like lactose. It does not ferment lactose and produce a, a pink color uh, on McConkie's media. 
So, and of course, it also says that it's a rod. So this is very clearly, uh, the answer to this question, of course, is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Another thing that tips you off that it's Pseudomonas aeruginosa is that this is a burn patient. So burn patients are commonly infected with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, cancer patients are commonly infected with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And cystic fibrosis patients are commonly infected with Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So as you can begin to see, Immunocompromised individuals, regardless of whether they are cystic fibrosis, burned, or, or have cancer, are most likely to come with infection by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Really, none of the other answers are correct, even though E. coli, Klebsiella, and Legionella, they are, and, and Serratia, are all gram-negative rods. Uh, Pseudomonas is the only possible answer uh, for this question. All right, next question. Um, th this will be interesting to see if you get this. A 35-year-old Cajun man, uh, and a Cajun is just someone who lives essentially around in New Orleans. I realize that may not be a term that you're familiar with, but a Cajun is someone who's going to be living in Louisiana in the United States. Unfortunately, you're going to have to learn uh, the geography of the United States as well because that, that becomes important, as you will see in the answering of these questions. So the fact that the man is Cajun tells you that he's essentially around Louisiana, and you can see that, living in the bayou, of uh, Mississippi River near New Orleans develops a tuberculosis-like uh, illness with formation of masses within the lungs. PPD is negative. PPD means purified protein derivative, which means that you're looking for tuberculosis. But the histoplasma in skin test is positive. CT guided biopsy of one of the lung masses would most likely, would be most likely to demonstrate which of the following? Two to five micron yeast with a thin cell wall but no true capsule. A four to 10 micron yeast with, broad, with a broad slimy capsule. A five to 25 micron yeast with a thick refractile wall and broad base budding. A 10 to 60 micron yeast with multiple budding or a 20 to 60 micron non-budding spherule uh, filled with endospores. So obviously they want you to say which fungus uh, is correct. Uh, go ahead and vote, please. <laughs> so I guess we need to go, look, go brush up on our mycology, right? Um, I thought that this one would give you trouble, and indeed it, it has. Uh, the correct answer is A, and that, that describes uh, histoplasma capsulanum. So this is the description, essentially, of what histoplasma capsulanum looks like. It's a two to five micron yeast with a thin cell wall but no true capsule. This is a Cryptococcus neoformans. This one is Brasilensis dermatitidis. Uh, this one is Paracoccidioides brasilensis, and this one is Coccidioides imitis. So you can see how picky uh, they can get. They, they will give you the description, and they want you to tell them which fungus they are describing. So you can see that uh, the group as a whole needs to brush up on their mycology. And, you know, I, that's understandable. That, that was not an easy question. All right, the next one then is... A 75-year-old woman consults a physician because she has fever, shortness of breath, and cough, which was initially dry but is now productive of rust-colored sputum. The sputum demonstrates, the sputum culture demonstrates gram-positive cocci, and colonies of the organism cause a greenish discoloration on blood agar, which are inhibited by optican. Which of the following is the most likely causative organism? Streptococcus agalactii, Streptococcus mutans, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Streptococcus pyogenes, Streptococcus sanguis. All right, go ahead and vote. Very, very good. The class got, the majority of the class anyway, got the correct answer. Um, 
surprisingly, a number of you missed this one, and, and we'll, I'll go over now why, uh, why C is the correct answer. What gives you information to tell you that the correct answer is streptococcus pneumoniae? First of all, of course, uh, these are all gram-positive cocci, streptococcus agalactiae, mutans, pneumoniae, pyogenes, and sanguis. So these are all gram-positive organisms. So they're all possibilities. So this really doesn't tell you anything because it says they're gram-positive cocci. The green discoloration, as I hope you all know, means that this organism produces alpha hemolysis, which is a green discoloration on a blood auger on a petri dish. That disqualifies then Streptococcus agalactiae. This is a beta hemolytic organism. It disqualifies uh, Streptococcus pyogenes, which is a beta hemolytic organism. It leaves in the running mutans, pneumoniae, and sanguis. Those are all alpha hemolytic. What tells you the answer to this question, the one point, and that's what you really need to understand, is that sometimes in the question there's one point which tells you the answer. And you have to be smart enough to figure out what that one point is and to find it, which allows you then to answer the question. So the one point in this question which tells you what the only answer can be is right here. And that is the organism is inhibited by optican. Streptococcus pneumoniae, sanguis, and uh, mutans, while they're all alpha hemolytic organisms, only streptococcus pneumoniae is inhibited by optican. Mutans and sanguis will grow in the presence of optican, so you can see then that the inhibition by optican is what tells you that answer C is correct, and, and those of you who got this, I'm proud of you. Uh, that's, that's a difficult thing to know. All right, we'll go to the next question. A 57-year-old man presents with an episode of shaking chills the previous night. He has now developed right-sided pleuritic chest pain, fever, sweats, malaise, purulent sputum, and mild hemopsis. On examination, the patient is diaphoretic, but alert, with right basilar rails. Chest x-ray films show a, lower, a right lower lobe infiltrate with blunting of the right cosophrenic angle. Why is this patient's sputum filled with pus? The answers are tychoic acids and peptidoglycan are chemotactic for neutrophils. The capsule of the causative organism is chemotactic for neutrophils. The causative agent is an intracellular organism. And if you remember back, I told you that you need to understand what that term means, and, and you see now that it has come up in a question. The causative agent is beta hemolytic, and I, I went through what beta and alpha hemolysis means in the last question. And then finally, the last answer is the organism produces an IgA protease. All right, go ahead and vote. All right, um, un unfortunately, the majority of the class missed this one. The correct answer is A, and it's relatively well known for people that work in this field that the tychoic acids and peptidoglycan uh, of this organism, this organism, of course, is, is Streptococcus pneumoniae, um, are chemotactic for neutrophils. Um, those of you that picked B, um, I'm assuming that you realize that the probable organism involved in this question was Streptococcus pneumoniae. And indeed, it is true that Streptococcus pneumoniae produces a carbohydrate capsule, which, which I told you in the beginning that, that you need to understand is an antiphagocytic virulence factor for this organism. But the capsule's, capsule's function is only protection. It's only an antiphagocytic structure. It does not have, it is not chemotactic for neutrophils and, and other phagocytic cells. Um, I just want to stress the point again that C is just wrong. The, or, the causative agent is an intracellular organism. Streptococcus pneumoniae is not an intracellular bacterium. As soon as it gets inside of a phagocytic cell, it's killed. So C is clearly wrong, as is D clearly wrong. In fact, I went over that in the last question. Um, the Beta hemolytic streptococci 
are the group A strep, uh, the group B strep. Those are the major uh, uh, beta hemolytic streptococci. Streptococcus pneumoniae is an alpha hemolytic organism, so you can see then that um, D is clearly incorrect. And then indeed the organism uh, does produce an IgA protease, but that's not hematactic, so that's why that one was wrong. And, and so A is the correct answer, so there's a question that you guys need to brush up on. All right, uh, the next question. All right, a 33-year-old woman presents with fever, vomiting, severe, irritating, voiding symptoms, and pronounced uh, costovertebral angle tenderness. Laboratory evaluation reveals leukocytosis with a left shift. Blood cultures indicate bacteremia. Your analysis shows pyuria, mild hematuria, and gram-negative bacteria. Which of the following drugs would best treat this patient's infection? All right, so go ahead and vote. All right, very good. The majority of the class got this one correct. However, a, a large I won't say the majority of the class, the a large number of the largest number of people in the class got this one correct. Actually, the majority missed this question. The correct answer is A, and ampicillin and gentamicin are two very good antibiotics for gram-negative bacteria, which, of course, is what this question tells you is that the patient was infected with. Essentially, a gram-negative uh, bacterium was isolated from this patient. Uh, erythromycin good against gram positives. Uh, gentamicin, while good, good gram negative antibiotic, vancomycin is really best for gram positive. So that uh, allows that one out. Uh, this one, D, is, is just not correct. And then tetracycline uh, is an antibiotic you would use for, say, the rickettsia, the chlamydia, and the mycoplasma. So that's why those, uh, those are wrong. So the 41% of the class got the correct answer, but a large number of you missed this question. So once again, then, I stress to you what I told you at the beginning. You need to write down all of the antibiotics, what their names are, what their mechanisms of action are, and would you use them against a gram-positive organism or against a gram-negative organism. All right, the next question, and now this is uh, immunology. Following a, a respiratory infection, a 20-year-old man goes to his physician for a follow-up visit. Physical examination is unremarkable, but dipstick analysis of his urine reveals marked proteinuria and microscopic hematuria. The young man is referred to a specialist who performs a renal biopsy. Immunofluorescent microscopy of the biopsy tissue demonstrates IgA deposition in the glomerular mesangium. These results are cons most consistent which w with which of the following disorders? Berger's disease, good pasture syndrome, minimal change disease, post streptococcal glomerular nephritis, and systemic lupus erythematosus. All right, go ahead and vote. All right, this, this one is uh, uh, disappointing to say the least. The correct answer is A. Uh, this is the definition of Berger's disease. It's an IgA nephropathy. Um, those of you, who, the 21% of the class who got it, I congratulate you. The 46% picked post streptococcal glomerular nephritis. And what should have tipped you off that that was not correct is this right here the IgA deposition. Most of the time, in post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis, you're looking at IgG and, and IgM. So this is indeed the definition, Berger's disease, IgA nephropathy is indeed the definition of Berger's disease. Good pastures, of course, is a type 2 hypersensitivity, and that's why I stress to you that you need to understand type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4 hypersensitivities. 
Uh, minimal uh, change disease is most commonly seen in uh, children two to three years old. And here, here's another uh, point that I'll stress to you. Um, not only do you need to understand the geography of the United States, for example, the, the, the Cajun uh, question that I told you about, but you need to understand age differences. And so the fact that this is a 20-year-old man, whereas minimal change disease is most commonly seen in children two to three years of age, tells you then that minimal change disease is not correct. So when you see a geographical location in a question, it's giving you important information. So they don't give you a geographical location in these questions for no reason. So look at the geographical location and say, what is this telling me about how I answer this question? And then when they give you an age, say, what is this telling me? Because they don't give you an age for nothing. They give you an age because it's important. And, and that then tells you that it's not minimal change disease. And then, of course, SLE, uh, you're not going to see uh, kidney problems in this situation. So there's um, important bits of information uh, in that particular question. And I think we're going to take a break now, Dr. Beal. A five-minute break. I'll, I'll see you guys back in five minutes. So just as a quick reminder, um, I'll ask Dr. Strauss in about 45 minutes to pause and we'll see if you have any questions. If you have questions, we'll pass it on to him. If not, he will continue until about 3 o'clock. Again, if you don't feel comfortable asking a question out loud, write it down on a piece of paper, pass it over here to the to the aisle and we will read it for you. Dr. Strauss? All right, um, welcome back. A, a young lady came up and asked me to, um, before I go on, to describe uh, good pasture syndrome because she said that she was not familiar with it. and. Um, I'll just tell you that good pasture syndrome is one of the type 2 hypersensitivities. Uh, what's involved is the production of uh, uh, cytotoxic uh, antibodies and just say, suffice it to say that good pasture disease, the cytotoxic antibodies affect the lungs and the kidney. And I uh, spoke with Dr. Graham who's going to speak next and she said that she is going to go into great, uh, or greater detail and depth in describing good pasture syndrome. So if that's something that you're not familiar with, then you'll hear a great deal more about it today. And uh, I think that, of course, is quite good because that's exactly what we want to do, is to bring you information uh, that you might not know that you indeed need to know in the future. So we'll move to the next question then. All right, this one, uh, this one may give you trouble, but if you know certain things about these organisms, you should be able to answer this question. A 35-year-old woman presents to a gynecologist with complaints of burning on urination for the past two days. Dipstick test of her urine demonstrates market, marked uh, positivity for leukocyte esterase but no reactivity for nitrite. Urine culture later grows out large numbers of organisms. Which of the following bacteria are most likely to be responsible for this patient's infection? The Enterobacter. Enterococcus faecalis, uh, Escherichia coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, or Pseudomonas aeruginosa. All right, uh, go ahead and vote. All right. Um, unfortunately, that, that this is a very disappointing uh, 
response. And let's go over why um, uh, you, you so badly missed this one. If you look at those five organisms, do you see any organism there that's different? Enterobacter, gram positive or gram negative? Who wants to tell me? All right, I'll tell you. It's gram negative. E. coli, gram positive or gram negative? Gram negative. Klebsiella pneumoniae, gram positive or gram negative? Negative. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, gram positive or gram negative? Negative. Enterococcus faecalis, gram positive or gram negative? Positive, aha. So you look at those five organisms and one of them is different. And of course, the correct answer is the one that's different. It's B. You see, it's the only gram positive organism up there. Okay, and so that threw you guys. And I understand why you picked E. coli because urinary tract infection got to be E. coli, right? Well, in this case, it's not. So you really jumped the gun on this one and you didn't stop to think, what are those five organisms? And you probably looked at those five organisms and said, aha, five gram negative rods, it's E. coli, it's easy. But, but you went too fast and therefore you missed it. Now, not only the fact that this organism, Enterococcus faecalis, is gram positive should have tipped you off, but what it really also should have helped you is this no, no reactivity for nitrites. So what happens in, in a urinary tract infection is gram negative rods take nitrates in the body and they convert them to nitrites. Gram negatives do that, gram positives do not. Therefore, you can look for a gram-positive organism, and the answer is, aha, there it is, right there, Enterococcus faecalis. Enterococcus faecalis cannot take nitrates to nitrites, therefore, there was no reactivity for nitrites. And I can understand why you missed that one, but still, if you had taken this exam, you would have missed it. So look at the organisms, and remember I told you, gram know which organisms are gram-positive and which organisms are gram-negative. And if you had done that on this question, you would, have, you would have gotten that one right. All right, next question. <clears throat> All right, approximately one week after starting therapy for a complicated urinary tract infection caused by Proteus mirabilis, a 13-year-old girl develops leg cramps, myalgias, and arthralgias. Which of the following medications was this patient most likely described? All right, go ahead and vote. All right, um, actually the uh, B is correct on this one, so uh, most of the people who answered this question got it right. Um, low, uh, the, floxacin, uh, the afloxacin antibiotics, of course, are the quinolone antibiotics. They hit the DNA gyrases, and that is the correct answer for this one. Um, metron metronidazole, of course, you would use against anaerobes, rifampin against mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, tetracyclines against the rickettsia. Um, chlamydia, those types of organisms, and um, azithromycin is not effective against proteus, so that's why that one was incorrect. So the correct answer to this one was B. So once again, uh, I stress that you write down the names of all of the antibiotics, their mechanism of action, and which organisms, gram positive or gram negative, they would be effective against. All right, the next question. Uh, this. This I think you will find difficult. This is immunology. A newborn infant with aplasia of the thymus and parathyroid glands, defects of the esophagus and heart, and facial abnormalities are di diagnosed with the de George syndrome. So this is now is an autoimmunity question, and I recommended that you write down each of the autoimmune diseases and know what the defect is, and also the signs that you would see in the individual, because that will be an important part of the question. Despite the presence of thymic aplasia, 
the infant would be able to initiate an antibody response to which of the following antigens? This is, this is not an easy question. E. coli flagellin, E. coli porin, FITC stands for fluorescein isothiocyanate, if you're not familiar with that, FITC uh, bovine serum albumin, HIV GP120, and penicillin. All right, go ahead and vote. Uh, as I suspected, um, this, would, this was a difficult question, and, and indeed, uh, the majority of the class did not get this right. The correct answer is A. And it's really um, quite simple once you know the trick to this question. If, if you don't make T cells, you can respond then to T cell independent antigens only if that antigen has a regular repeating structure. So I'll repeat that again. If you, are, if you can't make T cells, then you can't respond to T um, dependent antigen. So you can then make a T independent response only to antigens which have a regular repeating structure. And E. coli flagellin has a regular repeating structure, which means that you have a structure here, and then down the line it repeats again, and then down the line it repeats again, and down the line it repeats again. So that's what a regular repeating structure means. None of the other four, E. coli porin, FITC, BSA, HIV, GP120, or penicillin have a regular repeating structure. So that's why the answer A is correct, and of course, uh, none of the other ones are. That's not an easy, it was not an easy question, but I, hopefully you have picked up an important uh, uh, component and, and thought for questions in the future. All right, we'll go to the next question then. Infection of the thyroid gland can induce the expression of major histocompatibility complex, a uh, class two antigens on thyroid cells. Which of the following cell types would initiate an autoimmune response that leads to the onset of Hashimoto's thyroiditis? All right, uh, go ahead and uh, vote. Very good. We don't really need to discuss this one too much. That indeed is, is correct. CD4 T cells uh, don't normally make the type 2 antigen until they become infected. And so the correct answer then is, is indeed B, and I see that you guys have learned, uh, you've learned well on that one. Obviously, um, B cells, CD8 T cells, which of course are cytotoxic cells, macrophages, and natural killer cells uh, is not the answer. So obviously that's a point that, that the group has learned, and, and once again, I'm proud of you for knowing that one, because that was not an easy question. All right, uh, the next question. A 35-year-old woman with Graves' disease gave birth to an infant who shows symptoms of the same disease. The infant would be expected to respond well to antithyroxine treatment, cyclosporine treatment, removal of antibodies to the thyroid-stimulating hormone by plasmapheresis, thyroxine treatment, and treatment with serine-containing antibodies to T cells. All right, go ahead and vote. Very good. The majority of the class got this one correct. The answer is indeed C. And of course, because the um, antibodies, the production of these antibodies is essentially what causes Graves' disease, and, and once again, as I told you, you should know all of the autoimmune diseases. If you remove those antibodies, uh, the antibodies to the thyroid stimulating hormone are what is responsible for uh, the bulging of the eyes that one sees in Graves' disease by plasmapheresis, which means you, you're removing the antibodies, you can then re return the uh, um, cells to the individual. 
that would indeed uh, help greatly in, in uh, curing the Graves' disease of this individual. So C, then, is the correct answer, and of course, none of the other ones, uh, none of the other ones are. All right, uh, the next question. Okay, the George syndrome uh, is characterized by congenital aplasia or, or hypoplasia of the thymus and parathyroid glands. In individuals with this syndrome, production of which of the following substances which would be most impaired? And you can go ahead and vote. Very good. The majority of the people that answered this question uh, got it correct. Indeed, the answer is D. Um, T cells are the major uh, producers of the inter interleukin-4, and of course, if they're gone, then you're not going to get interleukin-4 production, and uh, D is the correct answer. Um, simply complement IgM antibody interferon beta and tumor necrosis factor alpha are, are, are not correct. So. Uh, D is the correct answer for this one. So once again, the class did very well. All right, we'll do the next question then. All right, so here is where you need to understand, and I told you that you, one needs to understand spore production and uh, anaerobiosis. A 65-year-old woman with diabetes elitis complains of a sore on her small toe. Examination of the toe shows discoloration and necrosis with gas in the tissue. Results of a gram stain of the exudate from the lesion are shown in the photomicrograph. Which of the following would be used to isolate the disease agent? Blood auger and aero uh, aerobic conditions, buffered charcoal yeast extract auger grown at 35 degrees centigrade in 5% carbon dioxide, chocolate auger and a high concentration of carbon dioxide, egg yolk auger and anaerobic conditions, and Sabarud's dextrose auger grown at 25 degrees centigrade under aerobic conditions. All right, uh, go ahead and vote. Very good. The, the vast majority of the class got this one correct. Uh, the answer, of course, is D, egg yolk auger and anaerobic conditions. Uh, the name of the organism, is there anyone want to tell me what this organism is? All right. The, the name of the organism, of course, is Clostridium perfringens, which, of course, as I told you, is a strict anaerobe. That's why this organism must be grown in anaerobic conditions. The uh, egg yolk auger portion, um, we'll just take a little a moment to teach something here. The reason why egg yolk is there is the major virulence factor of Clostridium perfringens is called the alpha toxin. And the alpha, alpha toxin is a lecithinase, which of course means that it's an enzyme that destroys lecithin. And the reason that you use egg yolk auger is that because the organism produces the lecithinase, it destroys the lecithin in egg yolk and it becomes opaque. And this tells you then that you're dealing with Clostridium perfringens. And of course, you want to grow Clostridium perfringens in anaerobic conditions because it will not grow in aerobic conditions. So you can see then that this is the only possible answer because it's the only one that asks you to grow the organism anaerobically. If you look at the micrograph, you can see the organism is a large gram-positive rod. And the only important uh, large uh, gram-positive rods are the bacillus and the clostridia. But of course, the clostridia, it can't be bacillus because you need to grow this organism in anaerobic conditions. And that, of course, is why that um, D is the correct answer. Uh, Clostridium perfringens causes gas gangrene, which of course is, is uh, what this woman has. It tells you this right here in the question. With gas in the tissue, that tells you then to move towards Clostridia, that it's not a bacillus. 
uh, to move towards clostridia. And then, of course, if it's clostridia, you have to grow the organism under anaerobic conditions. Now, just for your own information, the reason why the clostridia produce gas in tissues, the gas that they produce is nitrogen. And what happens then is when the clostridia grow in the human tissue, they produce nitrogen, which drives the oxygen out of the tissue. So the oxygen in the tissue is displaced with nitrogen. You now have anaerobic conditions, and that's what allows clostridium perfringens to grow in the tissue. So the group did very well on that question, and D is the correct answer. All right, next question. All right, you'll, you'll like this one. You may not get it right, but you'll like it. A number of fellows and attendings from the Department of Medicine come unexpectedly to a physician's office at the Employee Health Service over a two-day period, complaining <clears throat> of one to two days with multiple episodes of a watery diarrhea. Some have had blood visible in their stool. Some have had profound abdominal cramping and fever. All affected individuals attended the same buffet-style dinner several days earlier. Stool cultures at 42 degrees centigrade grow microaerophilic oxidase-positive gram-negative curve rods with polar flagella. What is the most likely source of this infection? So the first thing they ask you to do is you have to identify the organism. All right, so that's the first thing you have to do. Then they ask you to take another step further and say, what is the most likely food source that this organism would be found in? So your task now is to do two things. Figure out what the organism is. They give you enough information to do that. And then you have to pick what is the most likely food that this organism would be found in. All right, go ahead and vote. <laughs> well, we have a problem, okay. I'm sorry, but um, I, think, I think you see the, the possible problem. There's only five choices there, and there are eight or nine choices here, so I have to apologize. I never thought that that would happen, but it has. All right, so um, there was no way you could have gotten it correct with those five, so what I'm saying is, is the first five choices are not right. So what would you think, you'll have, to, you'll have to yell it out, what would you think would be the correct answer to this question if it's not A through E? What do you, what, what do you think? Anybody want to tell me? Someone shout it out. Or first of all, what, what is this organism? I did not hear it. Okay. If I told you then the organism here is Campylobacter jejuni. All right, Campylobacter is a gram negative. It's oxidase positive. It's microaerophilic. And here's a key for Campylobacter is it grows at 42 degrees, whereas most pathogenic bacteria like 37 degrees. So, and of course it has, it's a curved rod with polar flagella. So this tells you then that the correct organism is Campylobacter jejuni. So then what do you think the correct answer is? Say again? The, the correct answer is indeed F. And the vast majority poultry dishes, the vast majority of food poisonings in the U.S. anyway that are caused by Campylobacter jejunii come from poultry dishes. Now, essentially what they've done in this question is they've given you pretty much all of the food types that cause uh, food poisoning. Custards and potato dishes would, would be, could very well be Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, carrier food handles would be Salmonella. Milk and cream would be Listeria. Uh, poorly canned green vegetables would be Clostridium botulinum. Poorly washed salad greens. In, in the U.S., a tremendous number of uh, E. coli infections are caused by poorly, uh, by poorly washed salad greens. The salad greens in the U.S. become contaminated with fecal material containing E. coli, and uh, the ingestion causes, of course, uh, very serious food poisoning. 
The correct answer to this question is F. The majority of food poisoning cases caused by Campylobacter is, are due to poultry dishes. Rare red meats, I guess, would be E. coli. Rice dishes would be, be Bacillus cereus. Bacillus cereus produces bacterial spores, which can survive uh, relatively high temperatures. So this one would be rice dishes, um, would be Bacillus cereus. Smoked fish would be something like um, Vibrio uh, parahemolyticus and soft cheeses would be something like listeria. So in this question, then, they gave you all the possible food groups that might cause food poisoning. They asked you to figure out what the organism is, and then what food would that organism most likely be found in. And in the US, the correct answer here is F. So there's no way that the class could have gotten the answer to that question, and, and I hope you learned something from the discussion. All right, this next question. A one-year-old child develops a voluminous watery diarrhea and vomiting. She is brought to the pediatrician by her parents and evaluated, then sent home with instructions for the parents to give the child an electrolyte replacement solution. Which of the following viruses is the most likely cause of the child's diarrhea? Coronavirus, lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus, Norwalk, uh, Orbi virus, or the rotavirus? All right, go ahead and vote. Very good. I see we don't really need to discuss this very much. Rotavirus, of course, is, is the correct answer. Now, I, I will say um, that a few people picked Norwalk, and I can understand why Norwalk indeed, of course, causes um, serious problems, for example, on passenger ships when the Norwalk virus is on the ship. Uh, people have gastrointestinal problems uh, who have gotten this organism in their gastrointestinal system. But here, uh, once again, as I've told you, here is an important point, and I'll stress it again. When they give you the age of the individual, that's important. And here they tell you that this is a one-year-old child. Rotavirus is the obvious answer here because rotavirus hits young children. It's not the only obvious, other obvious possibility, which is Norwalk, because Norwalk hits more likely to hit adults. So for those 8% uh, of you who pick Norwalk, remember that Norwalk more likely is going to hit an adult, where, of course, the correct answer to this question uh, is the rotavirus. All right, next question. Uh, a pastry chef cuts his finger while slicing a cake. After a week, the site of the injury is warm, red, and swollen, and begins draining pus. While preparing some cream pies, he contaminates the custard with drainage from the lesion. The pies were eaten, it sounds appetizing, doesn't it? The pies were eaten several days later by patrons of the restaurant. Within four hours, they developed diarrhea and vomiting with no fever. Which of the following organism, organisms would be most likely the one that caused these symptoms? The answers are Bacillus cereus, Clostridium, Clostridium perfringens, E. coli, Shigella sonii, and Staphylococcus aureus. All right, go ahead and vote. Very good. The majority of you got the correct answer. The correct answer, of course, is Staphylococcus aureus. Now, um, for those of you who missed it, uh, we'll just go through it briefly. Um, the reason why it's Staphylococcus aureus is because, of course, we have this organism on our skin. So the fact that the pastry chef cuts his finger while slicing a case, the most likely organism to infect that cut finger, of course, is going to be Staph aureus because that organism is found on the, on the skin. While preparing the pies, he contaminates the custard from draining from his lesion. And what happens then is the Staphylococcus aureus actually begins to grow on the pie and produces the uh, toxin, the enterotoxin, on the pie. So when you eat, when people eat the pie, they're, n they're not becoming infected. They are being poisoned by the toxin that the organism has grown when it was growing on the pie. So that's why, and this is key, 
That's why the diarrhea occurs so rapidly. It, it occurs in two to four hours because you don't have to wait for the organism to grow to produce the toxin. You've already ingested the toxin. But if it was E. coli, the diarrhea would not begin in two to four hours. It would take at least 24 hours because the organism has to grow in the gut to produce enough toxin to cause disease. So anytime you see a food poisoning where the person begins to suffer diarrhea and vomiting, in two to four hours you know immediately that it's Staphylococcus aureus because what you're doing is eating a preformed toxin and you don't have to wait for the organism to grow. All right, next question. A 57-year-old fisherman with a history of alcoholism is hospitalized in Gulfport, Mississippi, which is in the uh, southeastern part of the United States. And so once again, this is a geography question that you need to understand. With a one-day history of severe watery diarrhea after eating several raw, raw oysters, he is badly dehydrated on admission and has numerous fluid-filled vesicular lesions on his legs. Within 12 hours, he becomes severely hypotensive and dies. Which of the following pathogens is most likely the cause of this man's death? All right, go ahead and vote. Very good. Once again, the, ma the majority of the class got the correct answer, which is Vibrio vulnificus. And this is a Vibrio that essentially lives, can live in seawater, and uh, people can become infected with this organism on their legs, and it extremely, becomes extremely uh, destructive uh, when you get leg infections, which, which this man uh, has gotten. And of course, he also ingested, possibly ingested the organism. This org uh, Gulfport, Mississippi is essentially down uh, on the Gulf of Mexico in the United States. So what they're telling you in this question is this man is exposed to seawater. Uh, he ate raw oysters, which could have indeed contained the organism. He also could have got infected in his legs by walking in seawater where the organism would live. The reason why um, D is not correct uh, which, which was the only other choice that uh, people picked, is that Vibrio cholera requires a really healthy infectious dose. Probably you need to ingest about 10 to the 8th organisms to come down with cholera uh, due to Vibrio cholera. So what gives this, uh, tells you that this is not, um, Vibrio cholera is not the correct answer, is these numerous fluid-filled vesicular lesions on his legs. Only a Vibrio bonificus produces those. Vibrio cholera would, would not. Vibrio cholera, of course, would produce a massive uh, diarrhea, but it would not produce these uh, vesicular uh, lesions on the legs. So the class got, majority of the class got this answer correct, and I hope I've explained to you why a Vibrio cholera is not correct. All right, next question. All right, a three-year-old child who attends a large daycare facility has a sudden onset of a severe gastrointestinal illness. The child is experiencing fever, drowsiness, vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. By the third day of the illness, the child is having more than 20 bowel movements per day, and mucus, blood, and pus are seen in the stool. Weight loss and severe hydration are developing. Which of the following is the most likely causative organism? The answers are Bacillus anthracis, Salmonella typhi, Shigella sonii, Vibrio cholerae, and Yersinia pestis. All right, go ahead and vote. All right, very interesting. All right, you're going to learn something very important here, and, and I understand why 45% uh, of you picked B, but let's talk, why, uh, talk about why now that is not correct. So you see that, that the group had a hard time deciding whether it was caused by Salmonella or Shigella, and, and I can certainly understand uh, why you would have trouble with that, but after we go through this, you'll never have trouble with it again. Salmonella and Shigella, of course, are both gram-negative organisms, and they both can cause this type of disease. 
But if you remember, I told you that when they give you the age of someone, it's important. And this then, the age of this individual tells you that the correct answer is Shigella and not Salmonella. And the reason why Shigella is correct is because the infectious dose in Shigella is tremendously low. Probably around 200 organisms would be an infectious dose for Shigella, whereas an infectious dose for Salmonella would be essentially 10 to the sixth to 10 to the eighth organisms. So I think then, if you stop and think, what happens in a daycare center if one child has Shigella and he goes to the bathroom and he doesn't wash his hands and he picks up a ball and he plays with it and he gets Shigella on the ball and the next kid comes along and puts that ball in his mouth, you can see how a very small number of organisms would be transmitted from one child to another. But if the same thing happened with a kid who had Salmonella and he got Salmonella on the ball, he's not going to be putting 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 8th organisms on that ball. So what tells you that the correct answer is C is because it's in a daycare center and there has been no ingestion of food in this particular situation. Shigella has a very low infectious dose, 200 organisms. Salmonella requires the transfer of 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 8th organisms. So usually you get salmonellosis by ingesting food that has the organism in it because that's the only place that you're going to see 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 8th organisms. Whereas you can get shigellosis, uh, 200 uh, colony forming units of an organism, just by picking up an object and putting it in your mouth. So that's why uh, the correct answer is C and not uh, B. And once again then, any time you see a young child in a daycare center, the correct answer, if it's act asking for a bacterial uh, source, it's always going to be Shigella. All right, next question. Oh, before we, before we do that, the other organisms obviously are not right. This is not anthrax, uh, this is not cholera, and this is not the plague. And you all know that Yersinia pestis causes the plague. Okay. A, a psychotic, indigent man with a history of multi-substance abuse has been in, involuntarily hospitalized for one week. Because of persistent diarrhea, stools are sent for ova and parasites, revealing numerous granular spherical uh, thin-walled cysts measuring 10 to 20 microns in diameter. Trichrome stain shows up to four nuclei and most of the cysts. These findings are consistent with infection by which of the following organisms? So here they're just essentially asking you to give them your knowledge of parasitology. All right, let's go ahead and vote. Very good. The vast majority of the class picked the correct answer, which of course is C. And you just really need to uh, understand the descriptions of these organisms. Um, Entamoeba histolytica, of course, has these um, spherical, granular spherical thin walled cysts measuring 10 to 20 microns in diameter. None of the, and, and of course, the four nuclei in most of the cysts. None of these other uh, parasites listed here have those properties. So you can see then that, as I told you, you need to write down the names of all of the major parasites, uh, be able to describe the diseases that they cause that you see in people and also their description because you can see they can give you a question where they describe the parasite and ask you to name it. But obviously I think you, you all have done uh, pretty well in parasitology because you, most of you, the majority of you got this question right. All right, the next question. A 28-year-old HIV positive man complains of pain on swallowing. Physical examination is remarkable for white plaque-like material on his tongue and buccal mucosa, which is scraped and sent to the laboratory. Based on these findings and on the laboratory results, the man is diagnosed with acquired immunodeficiency disease. Which of the following tests is most likely to confirm the identity of the causative agent? All right, go ahead and vote. All right, that, that, that's an interesting response. 
I'm not sure I know how to interpret it, but, but I will, uh, will attempt to. The correct answer is C. So what, what organism then is isolated from this individual? Who can tell me? Candida, I heard it. Candida albicans. What tells you that it's Candida albicans? Of course, anyone who, any AIDS patient's immune system is not going to be working very well, and so they are going to be open to many types of parasites, uh, I, I shouldn't use that word, many types of organisms um, that normally do not infect healthy people. And so this man then is, has been infected with Candida albicans, and what tells you that is this white plaque-like material on his tongue and buccal mucosa. So that when it's scraped and sent to the laboratory, the correct answer is C, because once again, here you see how they ask you, they ask you not only to identify the organism, but then you have to correctly identify the attributes of the organism. And if the correct answer is Candida albicans, which it is, the only one of these five possible answers is C, the germ tube test, because only Candida albicans of the, uh, of, uh, the possibilities produces a germ tube. And we'll just go over the other ones here because you may not be familiar with what, with what they uh, detect. The CAMP test detects group B streptococci. The CAMP test stands for Christie Atkinson Munch Peterson. Uh, you don't need to remember that. That's the names of the three individuals who discovered the test. But the CAMP test is specific for the group B streptococci or Streptococcus agalactii. So that's why that one is incorrect. The ELEC test, and, and I really don't know why you guys picked that, the ELEC test is a test for the production of the diphtheria toxin. So I don't know if, if that maybe is just something you hadn't heard of before, but the ELEC test picks up diphtheria toxin. That's why that's incorrect. It's not, obviously, it's not heterophile antibody test. This really is not looking for heterophile antibodies. It's looking for an attribute of um, candidate albicans. And the wild Felix test is a test for the presence of epidemic typhus. So this is a test which looks for a rickettsia prowazeki and, of course, uh, not candida albicans. All right, so hopefully then you, can, you understand what the ELEC test is in the future and, and only use it for uh, production of diphtheria toxin. All right. A traveler, next question, a traveler in Bogota, Colombia drinks a glass of fruit juice with ice cubes made from tap water. E. coli contaminating the water uh, supply grown in the traveler's intestine uh, synthesize a protein which causes his intestinal epithelium to overproduce cyclic AMP, resulting in a watery diarrhea. This syndrome is typical of which of the pathogenic strains of E. coli? The enteroaggregative, the enterohemorrhagic, the enteroinvasive, the enteropathogenic, the enterotoxigenic. Okay, so here you have to know your classifications, various classifications of E. coli. Let's go ahead and vote. Very good. You, you figure this one out, the vast majority got this one correct. The, of course, the correct answer is E, uh, enterotoxigenic. And of course, for those of you who did not get this, this it essentially tells you this here, the toxin uh, produced, the heat labile toxin produced by E. coli, this is its mechanism of action. It causes the overproduction of cyclic AMP, which results in a watery diarrhea. So obviously then the correct answer is the enterotoxigenic. These are other classifications. The, uh, just the entero, uh, aggregative, the organisms grow in aggregation. Uh, this one, of course, causes the production, B causes the production of blood uh, in, in the uh, stool. The enteroinvasive, it invades the uh, uh, colonic membranes, and the enteropathogenic essentially does uh, the same. This is the only one that, that talks about the production of the toxin, and that, of course, is why E is the correct answer. I would be happy to. Um, we, ha we have 15 minutes to go, is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. All right, would you like to uh, uh, ask questions or uh, like to continue? I, I guess Dr. Beal and I would be happy to do either. I'll just walk down one of these aisles and anybody has a written question, hand it to me. 
I'd be fine. All right, I guess we'll continue. Thank you, Dr. Beal, for that. <laughs> All right, we'll, con we'll continue. I, I hope you're enjoying this. I, I certainly am. All right, this, this, is, a, this is an interesting question, and we'll, and we'll see how you do on this, because this, this requires uh, not only knowledge of um, this particular he organism, hepatitis B virus, but, but using your head and thinking this through, because it's not an obvious question. Uh, a 34-year accountant re uh, returns home after a trip from Calcutta complaining of malaise, fatigue, and loss of appetite. Three months after the initial diagnosis, the results of the serological test reveal uh, HBC antibody, that's what the AB stands for, he's HC, HBC AB antibody positive, HBE antibody positive, HBE uh, antigen negative, that's what the AG stands for, is antigen. HBS antigen negative, HBS antibody negative, the presence, I'm sorry, the absence of HBS antigen and HBS antibody from the serum of this patient is reflective of which of the following. The patient has been successfully vaccinated against hepatitis B. The patient is allergic to hepatitis B. That means, allergic means non-reactive. The patient is immune to hepatitis B. The patient is in the prozone of antibody production. The patient is in the postzone of antibody production. And the patient is in the equivalent zone of antibody production. And I'm not going to ask you to vote because it won't do any good. Uh, that should tell you then that the correct answer to this question is F. All right? Now, what it's saying is, is if this person is obviously infected with hepatitis B, why does he have no HBS antigen and HBS antibody in his serum? Because he's infected and he certainly produced HBS antigen. Why then do you not detect HBS antigen and HBS antibody in his serum? And the answer then to this question is F. And, and the patient is in the equivalent zone of antibody production, which means that the antibody and the antigen in his system are identically the same. They combine and precipitate out, and therefore, you do not see either of these components in his serum. So here you have a situation where a person is certainly infected with hepatitis B. He certainly produces the HBS antigen, and he certainly makes antibody against that antigen. But when you look for the antibody and antigen in his system, you do not find it. And the reason, of course, is because an antibody-antigen reaction has occurred, and that has precipitated out, and it's no longer in the circulation system. So um, you, you can see that you would not have been able to answer that question because the uh, possible answers only go up to E. Next question. All right, this is, this is another interesting one. A 27-year-old woman with a long history of constipation develops severe pharyngitis and is treated with amoxicillin for a culture-verified streptococcal infection. The woman returns to her physician the following week with complaints of severe greenish, foul-smelling, watery diarrhea with lower abdominal cramps. Stool examination reveals no fecal leukocytes, and stool culture reveals no pathogens. On examination, she is febrile, and a complete blood count reveals a moderate leukocytosis. Which of the following is the most likely underlying cause of this patient's gastrointestinal symptoms? All right, go ahead and vote. Very good. Obviously, the group understood this question. For those of you who didn't get B as the correct answer, uh, this is obviously Clostridium difficile toxin. What tells you that it's obviously Clostridium difficile toxin? Uh, it, this tells you that. 
This individual was treated with antibiotics for a culture-verified streptococcal infection, and this is what sets people up for Clostridium difficile infection and toxin production. So what happens when you give people antibiotics, Clostridium difficile, of course, is a spore producer, and if it is in the gut and you give antibiotics to an individual and the antibiotics knock down the normal floor of the gut, the clostridial spores then can germinate and the organism can begin to grow. And that's what happened to this individual. And so this is why then this stool culture revealed no pathogens. If you take the stool culture and you grow it aerobically, clostridium difficile is not going to grow. So if the stool culture was grown aerobically, of course, no organism is going to grow because clostridium is a strict aerobe. And um, therefore, the fact that you use an antibiotic allowed the clostridial spores to grow. The stool culture revealed no pathogens. Therefore, you know that it's clostridium difficile that's causing the problems. And of course, what causes the uh, health problems in, in clostridium difficile is, of course, the toxin that the organism produces. It's not uh, uh, amoebiosis, it's not laxative abuse, it's not ulcerative colitis, and it certainly isn't Vibrio parahemolyticus. So the antibiotics that were used and the fact that the stool culture revealed no pathogens tells you that the correct answer to that one is B. All right, a 27-year-old woman presents to urgent care with complaints of urinary frequency, uh, urgency, and burning on, ur on urination. She has no fever. A urinalysis reveals the presence of pyuria and bac bacteria. The patient is given a prescription for an antibiotic and is informed that the use of antacids could lead to a therapeutic failure. Which of the following medications was the patient most likely to strive? All right, so go ahead and vote. All right, the correct answer uh, to this one, the class did not get, the although 31% of you did get it. The correct answer to this one is D. And this is my last question, so I will describe it to you and then, and then I will be done. Um, the reason the correct answer to this one is D is that antacids like uh, Tums or something like that has calcium in it. So some of the cations, calcium, magnesium, will bind with uh, the fluoroquinones like of, uh, ofloxacin. And when they do, when they bind with this antibiotic, then it affects the absorption and this antibiotic is not well absorbed. So that's why the correct answer to this one is D. Antacids have uh, cations like uh, um, calcium in them. If calcium binds to the uh, fluoroquinolones like ofloxacin, they are poorly absorbed and of course they will not work. And uh, as I understand it, Dr. Beagle, I am done. Thanks, Dr. Strauss. Um, five minute break, and then we'll begin with the uh, pathology. Thank you.